to the seed of the word of God being planted in your life that it would come forth that it would bring forth fruit that your life would change forever and if you're ready for the word would somebody just say in Jesus name Jesus. come on give God a hand clap of praise wow what a powerful atmosphere today the kids are dismissed to go down to kids' life. If you want to turn to your neighbor, shake somebody's hand before you're seated this morning. We're going to move into what God's put on my heart to preach to the church this morning. Hallelujah. Amen. You may be seated this morning. I just want to take a minute to... Uh, acknowledge this powerful atmosphere. Every Sunday is different at Life Point. Right. Every Sunday, God is doing something new. Everybody say He's doing something new. Doing something new. We might have a similar format, we may have a similar template, but when God takes control, when God begins to move in the music ministry, when God begins to move in, in the, the word going forth, you can guarantee that God is going to complete what he started. God's going to finish today what he's begun in this atmosphere. And it's going to transition, I believe. The anointing that destroys the oak is here in the building. And I love it when I feel the presence of God in such a powerful way. It's so easy to preach his word believing God for the miraculous. Amen. I want to talk a little bit about some of the things happening in February. It's the love month. Everybody say, oh, oh, all of that, all of that Valentine's business. But here at LifePoint, we're going to be talking about God's love. We're going to be talking about love for one another. We're going to be talking about love for the truth, love for the word of God. All this month, if you show up on a Tuesday night for prayer, or you show up for Wednesday night Bible study, and I know there's a wonderful meal prepared on the 14th. I'm looking forward to that. Everybody's welcome. And uh, we're just going to have a good time talking about Jesus' love. I, I tell you, if you ever want to go to the deepest level of your relationship with Jesus Christ, you'll never plumb the depths of his love. Amen. <laughs> So I believe it's going to be a month of, of deepening. I believe it's going to be a month where the deep calls unto the deep. Amen. I just kind of wanted to say one more thing, and then I feel like I'm just going to shift into what God has for me to preach this morning. But everybody say CFC. CFC. CFC stands for Christmas for Christ. It's something that we do every year, and, and I've mentioned it a few times before Christmas, but then the deadline will come up on that offering here probably in the next month. So I want to prepare you this morning, if you feel led of God to sacrificially give towards Christmas for Christ, it's an offering that we raise as a church that goes towards many wonderful things, and it goes towards starting churches in North America. It goes towards many programs for... Uh, basically a, a ranch for boys and some different things. I can give you all the details if you want them, but it's a very good cause. And we always give to Christmas for Christ. We sacrificially give to this offering for the last, the last 10 years that I've been here. We have uh, done our very best, amen, for Christmas for Christ. And our goal this year is $5,000, so you can partner with us if you feel led of God to do that today. I want you to uh, just put on your seatbelt this morning. We're going to go, we're going to go, amen, into what God has for us. It's going to be very exciting. If you have your Bible, let's turn to the book of Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. How many people love the Word of God? It is my greatest, my greatest privilege in life to preach the gospel, to preach the Word of God. And every Sunday is a wonderful, a wonderful opportunity to sit at the banquet table of God's blessing, eating from richly from His Word. Amen. <laughs> Book of Ephesians chapter 4, verses 30 through 32. I'm reading in the King James Version. The Bible says, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Turn to your neighbor and say, don't grieve the Spirit. Grieve, the Spirit. grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed until the day of redemption. So it is the Spirit of God that seals us. 
Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another. Somebody say amen. amen. Even as God, for Christ's sake. Everybody say, for Christ's sake. For Christ's sake, for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Would you help me pray this morning? Lord, I'm asking you to move in our midst, touch, bless, encourage God, and help somebody, Lord, today in this place, God. Somebody online right now, God, needs to hear what thus saith the Lord, has to say the church, God, the spirit, the bride, say come. And I just say, Lord, that somebody today is going deeper. Somebody's going further. Someone's going to get their name written in the Lamb's book of life. We've got baptisms in Jesus' name that we're doing today, and I'm excited. We thank you, Lord, for revival. We thank you, God, for your church today. And everybody said, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. For Christ's sake is a very powerful statement. Biblically speaking, it's a phrase that speaks of substitution and redemption. But in the world, saying for Christ's sake can be offensive. It can be used in such a way as to describe contempt, outrage, disgust, frustration, boredom, or even surprise. Other phrases that are related might be for God's sake, or for heaven's sake, or for goodness sake, or me, maybe even for Pete's sake, in reference to the Apostle Peter. How many have heard this before? Many of this stuff, if not all of these statements before. I've heard them before. I think I've heard them all. And to be honest, I think the way these phrases are usually used would be in a derogatory way. Would be in a cursing way, like when the Lord's name is used in vain. And I feel that as believers, we should always use the term for Christ's sake in a reverential way as we would whenever speaking the name of Jesus. Can I get an amen? Amen. When we're talking about Jesus' name, we're talking about the only saving name. When we're talking about Jesus' name, we're talking about the name that is no other greater name. Amen. So my intention today is not to title my sermon in an inflammatory way or in a provocative way, but my intention is to take back all the beauty and the importance and the redemptive power that God, for Christ's sake, has given the church. Amen. Come on, Life Point. are you glad that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and for the sins of the whole world? Come on, he's our divine substitute. He is our scapegoat, and he is our sacrifice that we might have salvation. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. For being the propitiation for our sins. Propitiation. Try saying that fast three times. What does propitiation mean, you might ask? To propitiate means to satisfy the wrath of God against sin. To turn away God's wrath or to offer a sacrifice that appeases God's just judgment and righteous anger against sinful mankind. Did you know it breaks the heart of God to see all the evil in the world? That he has given us a free will and we've turned the world into a mess and the world broke when it took the fall. And it breaks the heart of God and he has a righteous anger against sin and, and sinful mankind. And so Jesus is not simply the propitiator, but he is the propitiation. He is the sacrifice. He is the scapegoat. He is the substitute that took our place and took our punishment for our sins. Yes, he is. He is what satisfies the justice of a holy God. God would not be God if he did not have a moral obligation, a righteous obligation to set sin straight, to set things right in the world. And from the very beginning, he had a plan. Propitiation and atonement are different. Although very similar in meaning, 
we must remember that propitiation made atonement possible. Propitiation made atonement possible. Atonement in Christianity refers to the belief that Jesus dying on the cross was the sacrifice necessary to redeem the sins of mankind. How many people believe that? Amen. This sacrifice made God and mankind at one again, reuniting and reconciling us to God. I'm so glad that blood came down from that cross for you and for me. And I don't want to assume today that everyone here knows what atonement, redemption, or even what reconciliation biblically means. So let's quickly define these terms and compare them to what propitiation means to prove today how we actually can't have one without the other. Atonement means the reparation or the payment for sin or wrongdoing. Reconciliation means the process of making two opposite beliefs, ideas, or situations agree. And redemption means the action of being saved from sin, error, or evil. Redemption then is the action or regaining or gaining possession of something in exchange for payment. Everybody say in exchange. In exchange exchange for payment or clearing a debt. So basically, atonement, redemption, and reconciliation are only the agreements that have been produced or provided for the payment of propitiation. Without propitiation, there is no agreement. Without propitiation, we cannot fulfill the part of the bargain that needs to be fulfilled. Much like the animals that were offered as an atonement in the covenant or agreement with God in the Old Testament, but then had to be offered over and over again, in substitute, that is, until Jesus became sin for us. Come on, or he became our substitute. And so then by his sinless blood that he shed for us as the Lamb of God, once and for all, it was then that full payment was made by his death and then his burial and resurrection, powerfully validated, stamped off on the atonement of the cross or the new and now permanent or eternal agreement that payment is paid in full for the salvation of anyone who obeys the gospel of Jesus Christ. That sounds like a good deal to me. Come on, I want my name in that book. I want my name written in the Lamb's book of life. And I say yes. I say yes for Christ's sake to that agreement. Come on, watch this. The proof or the validation that this is all true is that the tomb is empty. Come on, somebody. Jesus is alive forevermore. Come on, if you believe that today, give the Lord a hand clap of praise because we are forgiven by God for Christ's sake. I got to watch how I say that this morning. Amen. I want it I want it to come across, right? Don't miss it this morning. Church, we can't have atonement. We can't have redemption. We can't have reconciliation without Jesus. Without his death, without his suffering and without his sacrifice. Right, right. Hebrews chapter 10 verses 1 through 5. It says, for the law having a shadow of things to come. There was a plan. God was working it out. Even back then, there was a shadow of things, good things to come. And not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices, which they offered year by year, continually make the comers thereon too perfect. No matter how many times they brought those sacrifices, they only pushed their sins ahead another year. There was no forgiveness that was long-lasting and and a one-time sacrifice. It was always to be offered again and again. For then would they not have ceased to be offered. So they had to do it over and over again because that the worshipers once purged would have had no more conscience of sins. So if they were really forgiven, they would never think about it again. But the Bible says... 
basically, that by offering sacrifices every year over and over again, they were made to feel guilty. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. Every time they came back, they remembered when they came back the last year and what they'd done then and what they'd done now. And, and it was always about this heaviness of sin and the memory of this condemnation. It says, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world... I get choked up when I think about it. When God in the flesh showed up, he saith, sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast prepared me. God prepared a body. God prepared a sacrifice once and for all. That would get the job done. God became a man. Not just to die on the cross, to make full payment, to purchase us with his own blood, but also to give us his spirit. Aren't you glad that God had a plan? God had a plan to make an investment. And that's why he gave up the ghost, the Bible says, on Calvary. So atonement was fulfilled by propitiation, and propitiation provided the promise of the Holy Ghost or the seal of promise of salvation. Notice how pure, how perfect, and how priceless and powerful that the blood of Jesus is. Not only does it redeem and save us from sin, but it also cleans us and prepares us for Pentecost. Hallelujah. I don't want to preach past this revelation. That God not only forgave us, he not only took our place, but he said, I'm getting ready, I'm getting you ready for this power of Pentecost, the power of my spirit inside of you. God's greatest investment wasn't only in paying for our sins, but it was then the pouring out of his spirit upon all flesh. The Bible says was prophesied that he would pour out his spirit upon all flesh. All this was planned from the Garden of Eden, and it was also prophesied throughout the Old Testament that the Holy Ghost would be provided after Calvary to prepare us, to prepare us for heaven, which is a prepared place for a prepared people. You're not just going to stumble into heaven. You're not just going to get to heaven by accident. You've got to understand the gospel. You've got to obey it. And you've got to have the power of the Holy Ghost. If you're going to make it, you can't get there on your own. It's the power of the Holy Spirit of God that brings you prepared to those pearly gates. Come on, somebody. This is good preaching today. About propitiation. Come on, receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost is God within us, which is our hope of glory. Emmanuel, when Jesus was born on earth, was God with us. And then it's our personal Pentecost when we receive the Holy Ghost. It's God within us. Come on, how can this be possible? This is called the mystery of godliness. Or the incarnation. Everybody say incarnation. Incarnation. The incarnation, it's not a flower you wear on your lapel. Come on. It's when God became flesh and dwelt among us. The incarnation are what was actually provided for us when God became a man so we could become like him. Essentially so we could become like Jesus. Come on, I'm telling you, the number one thing that might intimidate new converts and new believers is when you tell them, we got to be like Jesus, and they're like, what? I got to walk on water? I got to cast out devils and heal the sick and raise the dead? I said, hey, you don't have to, but you get to if you want to, because it's supernatural. You can't do it on your own. You got to have the power of the Holy Ghost which is Jesus inside of us. And that's how we begin 
to become more like him. It was the incarnation or God becoming flesh and dwelling among us, or it was Emmanuel, God with us, in God preparing a body that would be our propitiation for our salvation. All this was birthed from God's love. Come on, me, me and my beautiful wife, we met long ago, and uh, I fell in love, and then she kind of went along with it. <laughs> but out of that love, we birthed children. God blessed us with two beautiful children. Our family began to grow, and a ministry came. Out of that union, I want to tell somebody, a lot of good things can come from love. And all this talk about propitiation and the, and, and the power of the baptism of the Holy Ghost, it was all inspired. It was all motivated. And the payment was paid in full by Christ suffering on the cross because of His love for us. It was His love. It was His love that held Him on that cross. The Bible says that Jesus said, I could have called a legion of angels to take me off of that cross, but it was his love, not the nails that held him on that cross. And another word for propitiation then, biblically speaking, would then be love. Love's going to cost you something. All the men said amen. amen. I, heard a, I heard a preacher say one time, if you want a long and happy marriage, keep your mouth shut and your wallet open. Come on, love's going to cost you something. That's why we know that the Bible says that God is love. His plan was always to sacrifice. His plan was always there to stand in the gap. And love is an investment, isn't it? It's hard to love people, especially people you don't know very well. The hardest thing to do as a believer I've found in 24 years of serving the Lord is to trust people. Because you can't have love without trust. And I've met people and they're saying, praise the Lord, hallelujah, brother, and shaking my hand off. I'm thinking, I don't know this guy from Adam. I think he's, I don't know if he's legit about loving me. But I give him the benefit of the doubt. I begin to trust people and I try to love them back. And I think that's beautiful because the Bible says, by this will men will know that you are Christ's disciples, that ye love one another. So, so come on, just let your guard down and trust somebody today and, and let them love you and love them back. It's a beautiful investment. Here we are on the 1st of February, the love month, so to speak, with Valentine's around the corner, and I wrote a love poem for my wife this year. I hope she likes it. I'm looking forward to our Valentine's dinner on the Wednesday night Bible study on the 14th. Everybody's welcome. I'm going to tell my wife, I'm going to say, look at all the trouble I went through. Amen. Give you this big party on Valentine's. Another statement that's comparable to, for Christ's sake, that I've heard before, is for the love of God. <laughs> if you've ever heard that before, have you heard that before? Yeah. It's usually also used in a way that means people are fed up, or they're angry, or defeated in some sort of form or fashion. Let me ask the question today. Have you ever been fed up, angry, or defeated? Yeah. We say stuff like that. Right. We do. Yeah. But if love provided propitiation, then maybe it will also provide the same strength to be partakers of Christ's suffering. Think about it. Or when we say for Christ's sake, we need to live our lives in a sacrificial way because that's what it means. No matter what comes our way, church, we need to stay in love with Jesus. It's one thing to fall in love with Jesus. It's another thing to stay in love with Jesus. You come to Jesus because of his sacrifice. But you stay in love with Jesus by your sacrifice. I'll tell you how it works. The Bible said, pick up your cross and follow me. 
pick up your cross and follow me. Deny yourself. That means sacrifice. When your flesh wants to sin, you say, I can't. I got no time for that because I'm packing my cross. And it's heavy and I can't put it down to go to the bar. I can't put it down to fornicate. I can't put it down to go and do this thing that I know is wrong. God doesn't want me to live that way anymore. I'm not stopping for anything. I'm going to sacrifice. And sometimes sacrifice feels like you're suffering for Christ's sake. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 14 says, Beloved, I think it not strange. Come on, you're not supposed to think it's weird when you have a bad day, when everything's going wrong in your life. When we do, when we say, for the love of God, can something go right today? Just one thing, I've been there. And I start to realize, hey, if you want to be alive, Every breath in, there has to be a breath out. There has to be a birth. There has to be a death. If there's a, an up, then there's a down. It's not always downhill. Sometimes you've got to climb the mountain, and, and sometimes there's struggles in our lives, and, and so there's a balance. So what the writer is saying is, Think it not strange concerning the fiery trials, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. Come on, this is part of life. But rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings. Rejoice in sufferings that when his glory shall be revo- revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Jesus, happy are ye. Some people tell me, you're too crazy about Jesus. And I say, yes, I am. Guilty as charged. Call me fanatic. Call me crazy. I love Jesus, and he makes me happy. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you, and on their part is he evil spoken of. You see, that is the people who say Christ's sake as a curse word. But on your part, those of us who have decided to live for Christ's sake, he is then glorified. I don't know about you, but I want to live my life to glorify what Jesus did on that cross. I'll tell somebody, when somebody starts talking about Jesus, everybody gets uncomfortable. Don't you hang your head. Be ashamed of Jesus in public. You glorify him. Because there's people, what the Bible says, evil speak of these things. And there's people who say, no, 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 no. That's my Savior. Philippians chapter 1, verses 27 through 30. Is this good today? I think this is so powerful. This is going to help somebody today. Philippians 1, 27 through 30. The Bible says, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. That means don't cuss. Uh Uh-oh. That means don't doubt. Don't speak fear all the time. I meet people and they say, I can't pay my bills. I'm going to get kicked out. Everything's going wrong in my life. I said, it is because you keep talking like that. You're speaking those things into existence in your life. You're cursing yourself. That's why the Bible says right here, let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. You tell them like this, come hell or high water, I'm going to live for God. Come on, he went all the way to that cross for me. He died. He got his beard ripped off. He was whipped. And he died for me on that cross. I can go through a little trial. Come on, I'm going to make it. So that whether I come and see you or else I'd be absent because he was in prison. So I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit. There's unity in one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Come on, one man preaching the gospel ain't going to win this city. We all got to preach the gospel. We all got to be unified in what the gospel is. And then we got we to go out there and we got to preach it. And in nothing terrified by your adversaries. I told everybody, if the TV's freaking you out, turn it off. Don't get, don't get so hung up about, about World War III and all the things that's going on in the world. Focus on Jesus. Because the people who see you getting afraid, to them it's an evident token of perdition. They're saying, you're just like the rest of us. You don't have no strength in God. You got fear just like us. I don't fear man. I don't fear tribulation. I fear the Lord. Amen. I have a reverence for God and God only. Come on, that's where my, my salvation lies. And that of God. For unto you it is given on behalf of Christ. Not only to believe on him, but also suffer for his sake. Suffer for his sake. 
having the same conflict which Paul said you saw in me and now here to be in me. He's saying, you heard me go through some stuff? Paul went through some stuff. And the people who were like, you mean that guy that was here preaching, he's in jail? In jail, man, he's in the lowest part of the jail. And he's been whipped three times, 49 lashes, save one. He should have been dead. You figure after they took his, his, his jacket off the third time and seen the scars, like a road map on his back, they were saying, this guy, if he was supposed to learn, he would have learned by now. This guy doesn't listen. This guy's not going to change what he believes. People heard that, and it was to the glory of God. Right. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21 says, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Catch that. We're going to baptize people in Jesus' name today. That's the name of the family. Welcome to the family. If you want to be a part of the family, I'll baptize you in Jesus' name today. Of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Not one person's going to be in heaven that doesn't have the name of Jesus applied to their life in baptism. He would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. There's that Holy Ghost again. That Holy Ghost baptism, that's the power. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love, by say love, love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints, everybody who's ever made it, anybody who's ever lived for God, that ever plumbed the depths of the love of God, knows I'm going to be forgiven, God's going to save me, God's going to love me, He'll never turn His back on me. All the saints are learning they're, they're learning that by walking with him when he forgives you over and over and over again. Guess what you learn? The breadth and the length and the depth and the height and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge. Come on, I thank God for his love. And watch this. You spend your life trying to find how great God's love is that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. That's why I tell people, you know, the gifts of the Spirit, they're powerful. You know, the miraculous and the prophetic, that's amazing. But there's nothing deeper than learning about the love of God. Come on, knowing that they are immeasurably deep. And that's where you're finding the fullness of God. If you want to learn the fullness of God, you've got to go deeper in love. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. You see, that's why God gives you the Holy Ghost because he works it within us. The kingdom is within us. Don't miss it today. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout the ages, world without end. You know what that means? For eternity, love is never ending. <laughs> love is never ending. Amen. <laughs> Second Corinthians Chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. The Bible says that love helps us endure our thorns in the flesh. I can't just preach about what Jesus did for salvation. I'm talking about for Christ's sake, we suffer sometimes. We go through things sometimes. That's where the going gets tough, the tough gets going. That's where people backslide. That's where people walk away from God. That's where people give up. So I want to help you so you never do that. The Bible says, lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Paul was literally casting out devils, healing sick, raising the dead. He was doing miracles. He had all revelation in the Bible and the gifts of the Spirit. He was operating in all those things. And he still said, you know what? I don't want to get a big head. And the Lord, I'm going to stop right here. I'm not going to talk about what that thorn in the flesh could have been for Paul. Could have been a lot of things. Some things, some people think it was because he was blind. He said, if you would have plucked out your eyes, you would have gave them to me. He was preaching to a church. Some people think he, he was losing his vision. Some people think it was his past. He left his wife. He was a Pharisee, which means he was married. And then we see Paul single in his ministry for the rest of his life. So, so maybe he left his wife. Maybe he left his family. We don't know what that thorn in the flesh was, but I'll tell you this. Whatever happened to Paul in his life, even being whipped, even being imprisoned, yeah. it was for our benefit. That's right. Thank you. I'm going to leave that just for a second. He wrote most of the New Testament. Not because he was the most powerful apostle. It's because he was in jail. He had nothing else to do. But he wrote that for us, and what he went through was for you and for me. That's why we have the scriptures today. I'm thankful that Paul had a thorn in the flesh. He had to go through something. 
It was for our benefit. That's why we go through things sometimes. For this thing, I besought the Lord thrice. How many times have we done that? God, take away this trial. Take away this test. Take away this thing out of my life. It's so t- troublesome. I don't want to do this. And God said, I'll take it away until you're ready again. Round the mountain. We're going to do this over and over again until you learn how to trust me. And we just say, no, I mean, take it away forever. Take it away. No, no, no. You have to become who I want you to be. So there's things you have to go through to become that person. He prayed three times. Just like you and me. Prayed three times that it might depart from me. He said unto me, it's the way it's going to be. Grace is sufficient. Grace isn't is it, uh, uh, this concept of like all you can eat buffet. You can sin as much as you want and God's grace will cover it all. That's not how it works. The Bible says grace is sufficient. The word sufficient means just enough. See, because God knows the beginning and the end. God knows where you're going to fail. God knows when you're, is this okay? I want to go deeper. I don't want to just preach and shout and have a, have a move of God in the altar. Smoke clears. And somebody says, what did pastor preach today? It was so good. I can't remember. But the truth is, we have to understand that when we go through stuff, God's grace is sufficient for us. He'll bring us through. Right when we're going to quit, God comes along and supernaturally gives us the power to keep going. People tell me, pastor, I'm so tired of this. I'm tired of that. I'm going through stuff. I say, keep it up. You're getting stronger. You'll, he'll never let you fall. His grace is sufficient. When you need it, it'll be there. Don't abuse it. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. If your life was perfect all the time, you wouldn't need God. Hello. So strength is made perfect in weakness. It's when you fall. It's when you fail. That's when God's strength is made perfect in your life. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities. Here's Paul getting the revelation. He said, one time I almost quit on God. But God, he saved me. He saved me in my situation. He set me free. That's how we glory in our infirmities. I tell some people, I said, you know what? I used to do this. I used to do that. Their eyes get this big. You're a pastor. You can't do that kind of stuff. I said, man, but if it wasn't for God, I would have been lost. I would have been cast aside. People would have rejected me. You would have gave up on me. But God never gave up on me. And I glory in that. That the power of Christ may rest upon me. God doesn't want super Christians that never make mistakes and that, that everyone starts to worship. You don't worship the pastor. You don't worship the worship. You don't worship the preaching. You worship Jesus. So all of a sudden, every once in a while, we'll say, hey, that person just sang a little bit off up there. Hey, pastor's preaching too long today. Hey, I don't really like this song or that song. We start picking away at stuff. If you want to be critical, you'll find problems in the church. But God systematically put them in there. God allows those problems in the church because people will say, wait a second, these people are living just like me. They got troubles, but they don't give up. They glory in their infirmities. They're glorying in the problems they have. It's still about Jesus. They keep moving forward. You're getting it. Somebody's getting it this morning. Therefore, I take pleasure in my infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I'm strong. I don't have all the answers. I can't, I can't write your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. But I'm going to fight all the hell to help you get there. Come on. And finally, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 9 through 12. I want a lot of scripture this morning. I want you to get it. For I think that God hath set forth us, the apostles, last. Everybody say last. Because they were living for us. As it were appointed to death, for we are made a spectacle unto the world, and to angels and to man. Even the angels look into the church and say, what a mess. This is God's plan. God's going to fill them with his spirit. We don't even have the Holy Ghost as angels. What is he doing down there? They're looking into it. And it says, we are fools for Christ's sake. People think Christians are idiots. Is that okay to say that in the church? People think Christians are morons. People in the world say, what are you doing? You're giving money to this church and you're living for God and you're reading your Bible and you're trying to do all this stuff. Why don't you just do whatever you want? You don't have to listen to that book. You don't got to listen to that preacher. You can do whatever you want. You're an idiot because you're doing what they tell you to do. You're submitting and you're obedient to the word of God. You're a fool. I say, yes, I am. I'm a fool for Christ. I'm a fool for Christ's sake. You can call me 
what you will. You can call me crazy. I'm crazy about Jesus. And here it is. But you are wise in Christ. They may call you a fool, but you're the one who really knows what's going on. We are weak, but you are strong. They're saying, hey, we had to pay the price to preach this gospel. We did it for you that you might be strong. Now you are honorable, but we are despised. Even unto this present hour, we both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place and labor working with our own hands. Being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer it. Come on, we don't complain because we have the revelation. It's a good thing to be a fool for Christ's sake. Think about it. All the people who maybe use for the love of God, or for Christ's sake, as curse words, might look at us like fools for Christ's sake. And when we put others first, when we serve, when we give, when we sacrifice, when we try to live like Jesus, when we live our lives for Christ's sake, hard times will come. The price will have to be paid. Being persecuted, we may suffer. Even being made propitiation for others. Picking up our cross, denying ourselves, and following Jesus all the way to Calvary, all the way to Pentecost, and all the way to glory, all the way to heaven. Hallelujah. Let's all stand today. Let's all stand. Hallelujah. All the way. All the way. I don't want to just go halfway with Jesus. I don't want to just go halfway to my destiny. I don't want to just go halfway to the fulfillment of why God called me into the kingdom. You guys have a destiny. When I saw you sitting on the front row today, I said, they got a destiny. They got a passion. They've got a commitment. They've got a calling. And it's growing. It's pulling them closer and closer to what God wants for their lives. And, and all of us, all of us have a destiny. It's calling you. You feel a magnetic pull. Not just the blessings and promises, and, but to that cross. That cross is calling us. You see, when we sacrifice to raise money, maybe for Christmas for Christ, or any offerings for needs around the church, when we bring our tithes into the storehouse, somebody say amen. amen. When we give our offerings for Christ's sake, we see his love. When we live for Christ's sake, we see his glory. We see his face. We know his only saving name. We know his power. We understand the mystery of godliness. You see, I want us to worship around this altar this morning. Let's all gather together here in the front. If you're comfortable, you're welcome today. Would you come and pray together as the family of God here in the altar? We're going to gather at the front. And there are some today who will be water baptized in the name of Jesus. Amen. There are some today who are asking God to fill them with the Holy Ghost. Let's pray together one with another. Let's celebrate God's love and his investment for Christ's sake. He has forgiven us. He has redeemed us, and he has restored us by the power of his hope. propitiation. Come on, let me pray over the church today.